Well, I, we are, I'm also very happy to give this talk to you and to be joining this retreat with you all. And um, after I listen to our senses giving their Dharma talks, I felt very inspired by them and also by the love they have for this for the Sangha and for all of us. And I felt that a Sangha that is put together, that is glued together by love, is a Sangha that can never be destroyed. There is a deeper reason for me to give this talk from my shrine room and it's because this is where I practice and this is the energy that supports me in giving this talk. That's the deepest reason. So today I want to give a review of the two most important schools of Mahayana Buddhism. And uh, do you know these schools very well? But I hope that the way that I have been experiencing them and practicing them maybe shines a little more on the importance of this practicing these old teachings. It is said that the Buddha began his first teaching by talking about the importance of the practice of the middle way. Between any two opposites lies emptiness, which is a vast creative potential. The middle way is fluid and full of potential for our lives at this time in this planet with what with all that is going on on this planet the middle path is also called the great way the supreme way and it's also called the great mother Prashna Paramita. During the second century after death, our wonderful 15th ancestor Nagarjuna founded the school of the Middle Way. In Koan 15th of the Transmission of the Light, we can hear the story of Nagarjuna's enlightenment. It goes like this. When Kapimala, the 14th ancestor, responded to the Naga king's invitation, he received a wish-fulfilling jewel. Nagarjuna asked, This is the supreme jewel of the world. Is it formless or does it have form? Kapimala said, Do you only know whether it, it has form or not? You don't know that this jewel, neither it has form or is it formless. And you still don't know that this gem is not a gem. Nagarjuna became deeply enlightened. Nagarjuna was held in to the views of form and emptiness, life and death, existence and non-existence. 
That is why Kapimala said, you only know whether it has form or it, it is formless. When we enter in the realm that has no form or is it formless, this is, this is the realm of only, only direct experience. which is called the Sambhavakaya realm or body of enjoyment. The jewel is a metaphor for our inherent Buddha nature. Our Prasnaparamita nature. Omniscience. the ultimate jewel of the path. This jewel is not even a jewel. Any description, including the highest praise, falls short, falls, falls short of expressing the indescribable wonder of our inherent nature. The Sutra, Trust in the Hard Mind, expresses the teachings of the Middle Way. And it also expresses the teachings of the second school most important in the Mahayana school, which is the Consciousness Only School. The entire poem, Trust in the Heart Mind, give us teachings on how to walk the highest way. The Tao. And at the end of the poem, the poem opens up to the expression of omniscience. The Sutra Trust in the Heart Mind begins like this. The great way is not difficult for those who do not pick and choose. When preferences are cast aside, the way stands clear and undisguised. The great path, the great way, the Tao, is also known as the highest way, or simply the way, or as the great mother Prasna Paramita, as I mentioned before. Master Sengsan, their ancestor, third Indian ancestor, successor of Uike, which was the successor of Bodhidharma, warns us that when we discriminate in the slightest, earth and heaven and heaven fall apart. Through the practice of the middle way, we could have an experience of the Samboakaya realm, which is, which is an only experiential realm. No thought, nothing else, but direct experience can enter here. And here we could experience earth and heaven in holy matrimony as one, inseparable. How do we practice this, you might wonder. 
Just keep your mind free from discrimination. Keep your mind in the gap between opposites. In the gap between judgment and criticisms. Like in Leonard Cohen's lyrics, there is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. However, when we discriminate in the smallest amount, earth and heaven falls apart. And who wants that? Who wants earth and heaven to fall apart? Due to our ignorance, we walk the wrong path. Master Sengsan says that if we would see the truth clearly, we would discard our opinions for or against. And he warns us that clinging to our likes and dislikes is the disease of the mind. The problem is not that we have likes or dislikes. The problem is the attachment to our likes and dislikes. Through the practice of Zazen, we can develop the clarity to stay in the gap between opposites. And you can practice that in this retreat. Master Sengsan says that our mind becomes sick when it does not see the deep, this truth, the deep, the deep truth of the path. And we lose contact with this essential calm of the heart mind. The middle way is perfect like vast space where there is neither lack and no excess. But it is our attachment to selection that prevents us from realizing this simple truth. And it is this attachment either to the external world of things or to the internal world of emptiness that condemn us to entangled lives. The middle way is perfect, where nothing is missing, but clinging either to form or emptiness condemns us to entangled lives. The following verses explain this. When you say that things are real, you don't see their true nature. And if you say that things are empty, you also obscure their nature. The more you think and talk about this, the further from the truth to be. Cut off all unnecessary words and thoughts, and there is nowhere you cannot go. Cut off all unnecessary discrimination, all unnecessary judgment, all unnecessary criticisms, and there is nowhere you cannot go. Returning to the root itself, you'll find the meaning of all things. The root itself refers to our original nature as Prasnaparamita, mother of all the Buddhas. Carl Jung says that in the collective unconscious mind of all human beings, there is the mother of all things, 
as our ori original root. But when we chase after appearances, we do not see this original source. We awaken when we go beyond emptiness and form. All we have to do is to let go of our precious opinions. When there remains a trace of what is right and what is wrong, to mind is lost, obscure, distraught. Diversity emanates from unity. Nor should we become attached to this unity. The unity or non-duality of emptiness and form points out again to the Prasna Paramita Sutra. Lex Hickson Wright, in his introduction to his, in his book of Mother of All the Buddhas, where he is studying the Prasna Paramita Sutras. And he says that the feminine nature of Prasna Paramita is taken seriously by the Sutra. But this mother matrix, guide, power and bliss of all the Buddhas and their embryonic forms, the Bodhisattvas, is not simply tender and nurturing in some stereotypical sense of the feminine. Mother Prasnaparamita expresses her mystic motherhood as the uncompromising discipline of transcendent insight. And this is very important, how he describes this transcendent insight. A union of inexhaustible tenderness, a union of inexhaustible tenderness and diamond clarity that is like open space, heard directly by all the fully awakened ones, the humble lords of enlightenment. I was so excited um, when I found this quote that I told Roshi, and Roshi immediately said the part that says is heard by the all the the humble lords of awakening, Roshi immediately said, and the ladies too, exactly, and the ladies too. For many years, living at, here at the Abbey, I look at the starry night, and I wonder how in this wondrous universe, full of infinite galaxies, planets and stars, how come no one comes to help us here in our planet, where there are so many terrible things happening globally and locally? But there is help coming to us all the time. But when we are engaged in this, in unnecessary discrimination and negativities, our mind becomes close to receive this help. So practicing the middle way wholeheartedly is a way to increase our vibrational frequency. And receive this help. This help doesn't come from extraterrestrial life. 
This helps come from the Sambhavakaya realm. Prasna Paramita. Where there are countless enlightened beings ready to help all the time. I missed this when I was talking about the story of Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna had always been very important to me from the very beginning. When I heard about Nagarjuna, something about him, I didn't know. But it was so important to me that even my mayor, that is still alive to this day, 15 years later, her name is Naga. And she was the one actually that found Maitreya Abhi for us. As you know, what we call in our Sutra book, the Heart Sutra, is only a fragment of the Prasnaparamita Sutra, the Sutra of the Great Mother, the mother of all the Buddhas. As you also know, the Buddha Shakyamuni lived in India around the 500 BC. The teachings of the Great Mother were extended throughout India during that time. The Buddha learned these teachings, but considered that people were not ready to receive them. So he gave, the, he gave these teachings to the king of the Nagas, or water dragons. for safeguarding for more than 200 years until he predicted that a sage whose name that would start with the word Naga would come to retrieve these teachings. So in the introduction to his book, Mother of All the Buddhas, Lex Hickson, a PhD in world religions, writer, Sufi and Zen master, and successor of Bernie Glassman, which he is in our lineage, and, and to that I'm most grateful. Right. My intention here is to present in condensed form, a picture of the universe, as seen through the eyes of Prasnaparamita, the wisdom goddess. The great path has no limits beyond the easy and the difficult. But if we hold onto limited points of view, then we become fearful and insecure. Let go now of the clinging mind and all things appear as they are. In essence, nothing goes or stays. In Dogen's words, we would say, let go now of body and mind. Drop now body and mind. Drop now of your concepts about body and mind. Drop now all your concepts. When we realize the original nature of all things, then we walk the great way freely and undisturbed. When we walk the supreme path, we do not reject the world of the senses because as it is whole and complete, the world of the senses is illuminated. Seeking the omniscient mind with the thinking mind is a big mistake. When we no longer discriminate 
all things are as they are, as one. Reaching this mysterious source frees us from all entanglements. In the final verses of Trust in the Heart Mind, and I already mentioned the omniscient mind, Master Sensan refers to the mind of omniscience. So I want to talk about the consciousness only school, very important school, to understand the way most important to take at this time when there is so much suffering going in this planet and we can feel it because we are all connected. Another of our most wonderful ancestor, ancestors, our 22nd Indian ancestor, Vasubandhu, and his brother Asanga, founded the school they call Consciousness Only. They explain the existence of nine levels of consciousness. First were eight and then they double one into two, which it makes sense. It's very easy to understand this consciousness. But before I go into a brief description of this consciousness, I want to tell you that the first seven consciousness are nourished by the eighth, the storehouse consciousness. And we can use the symbol of a lamp with seven bulbs. The eighth consciousness is the current that illuminate or darkens the light of the seven bulbs, depending on what we collect in our warehouse consciousness. I'll briefly summarize uh, all these consciousnesses. The first five consciousness are the consciousness that belong to our senses. We are all familiar with them. We use them all the time. Consciousness, consciousness of the eye, perceived forms, ear consciousness, perceived sounds, nose consciousness, perceived smells, Others, tongue consciousness, perceive taste. Body consciousness, perceive the tangible. When I was eating yesterday, the sala that Echo and Kato prepared. I tasted, I tasted the guavas from my island, Puerto Rico. When I smell my mare, it takes me back to my childhood. Sometimes breezes come through the mountains that transport me to the ocean. So those are the five first consciousness, which are our senses. Very easy to remember. The sixth consciousness, 
This is our intellectual consciousness. It gives meaning to what we perceive through the five sensory consciousness. It is like a processing center that works in conjunction with the seven consciousness. It stores everything we have heard, felt, seen, tasted or smelled, and everything that we have learned through our life. Everything. Collects everything, but it's a in intellectual processing center. You all have experienced this consciousness, like when you try to remember something, a word maybe, the name of somebody, the name of a book, and suddenly you are blank, we don't remember, but our mind start going, going through all the files and then the file is found that's the sixth consciousness as well going through all its files the seventh consciousness or the contaminating consciousness this is very important. This is the consciousness that is very important to understand clearly. It is called contaminating consciousness because it is at this level where the false perception of a fixed and isolated self, self occurs. It is, it is at this level where the thinking mind clings to itself and creates the false belief of a separate self. It is at this level where we store our traumas. It is at this level where the mind, the seven consciousness, clings to itself and says, this is me, this trauma is me, this conditioning is me. These illusory seeds are stored in our storehouse consciousness and the communication with our previous consciousness is contaminated. We don't see clearly, we don't hear clearly, we don't smell clearly, we don't touch clearly. We don't, I don't know, I forgot, it doesn't matter. This is very important because our true nature of ourselves and the world contained on the ninth consciousness is obscure and out of reach. Because when the seventh consciousness latches to itself and creates a separate illusory self, then there is no access to the higher consciousness. We saw a loop that get closed. The ninth consciousness, omniscience, is always there. But because we have latched to that notion of a separate self, to our trauma, to our conditioning, to our negativity, to our discriminating thoughts, to, to whatever else, our rights and wrongs, our likes and dislikes. Our true nature is obscured and we are not aware of it, but it's always there. This is the basic ignorance that creates the suffering of samsara.
the eighth consciousness or the alaya or warehouse consciousness is located in the realms of the unconscious and it is called the storehouse consciousness because it stores all the karma whether positive or negative created throughout our lives the storehouse consciousness is the consciousness that never perishes all our karmic seeds from beginningless time are stored here and continue after death all actions and life experiences that occur through the first seven consciousnesses accumulate here as karma which in, ter in turn influences the functionings of the previous seven consciousness. I want to stop here and, and say something and I'll continue. Um, something that I want to tell you that is very special to me. As you know, I teach mostly with Spain because I have a Spanish heart and, um, and I know you are all loving people, but I have a difficult time receiving your inexhaustible tenderness and your expressions of love. And the Great Mother is an inexhaustible expression of tenderness. The Mother Prasna Paramita and Diamond Cutting Clarity. And this is what I love at our, at our, at, about our Roshi. The first, not the first time, but later on, maybe, I experienced his inexhaustible tenderness. And that's why I love him so much. And I wonder if in Zen we need some more of this tenderness. Um, tenderness in the way we treat each other, not only the power of diamond cutting clarity, because that without the inexhaustible tenderness is not complete. It's lacking heart. And, um, and I love you, but I also love the people in Spain, we hug, we kiss, we have many different expressions of love, we are relaxed, we say hello, we say I love you, we give hearts to each other, I don't know, is there is no expression of that inexhaustible tenderness of the Great Mother, Prasna Paramita, the Heart Sutra. We cannot access the eighth karmic consciousness with our intellectual minds, which are too superficial to reach this deep. However, to Zazen, our pure intention of our mind would allow us to transform deeply rooted karmic tendencies. It is possible. Just watch. When your mind attaches to itself and says, I'm great, or I'm no good, 
or I'm the best, or I'm the worst. Ah, oh, ah, oh, oh. that is the seventh consciousness attaching to itself. It's almost like it strangles itself with a rope. And then we cannot see the wide blue sky all open to unite with earth. Earth and heaven separate. And I have experience in a small amount what it is the union of earth and heaven. And I cannot tell you in words the, the, the biggest blessings that we have of human beings is to experience that union of earth and heaven together. The ninth consciousness or Amala consciousness. The ninth and deepest of the nine consciousnesses. Defilement free consciousness or pure consciousness. The ninth consciousness pervades all life through the universe. That's when we talk about interconnection, interrelation. That's because we are connected at that level of the ninth consciousness that we all share, whether we perceive it or not. The ninth consciousness pervades all life throughout the universe, not just in this planet, all life through the universe. It is the basis of all life, of all life functioning. And is known as the Amala of fundamentally pure consciousness share at the deepest level with all life, all life, all life. Mice, roaches, all life, nothing left separate. But I will also add also is shared at this deeper level with all the inanimate life. Pots, pans, plates, everything. This consciousness is pure, free of all contamination and corresponds to omniscience, omniscience. We are all endowed to this omniscience. It's not for a special people, it's for everyone that is willing not to attach to an idea of himself or herself. The symbol of this consciousness is an ocean of pure and crystalline waters. It's an oce oceanic consciousness. Our beloved ancestor Sengsan end his poem by expressing how the world is seen from this omniscience consciousness. And when we realize this omniscience consciousness, omniscient consciousness, it just autom automatically clean 
all the karma is stored on the eighth consciousness or the warehouse consciousness. What people call God, like they say, people see everything. No, there is not a God out there. It's our own consciousness who records everything, who stores everything. The sage of all times and places has awakened to this primordial truth. The way is beyond space and time. When one moment is 10,000 years. Not only here, not only there, truth is in front of your own eyes. The distinctions of big and small are no longer relevant. The biggest is the smallest too. There are no limitations here. What is, is not. What is not, is. If you are not clear about this, you are still far from the inner truth. One thing is all, all things are one. When you realize this, all is unified and complete. When trust and heart are not separate, and not separate are heart and trust, these go beyond all words all thoughts. From this moment, there is no yesterday, not tomorrow, not today. I'm a vulnerable person. Vulnerable doesn't mean weak, it means strong. I am vulnerable. And I don't mean that we need to be kissing everybody. I mean that it would be wonderful if we can all develop that inexhaustible tenderness in ourselves. And then however we want to express it, it's up to you. Um, Zen practice has been deprived from the mother, from the mother of all the Buddhas. And um, the situation in the planet is so critical. That the mother, the great mother, the mother of all the Buddhas, have to come up from underground. Yeah, this is, this is to what I dedicate my life to bring this mother back, in whatever measure my human life can do. Um, just wanna wanted to let you a little bit more about myself. Um, and that's why I practice in isolation because I'm developing the visualization of the mother of all the Buddha so I can manifest it in my life. So I can help the planet that way um, because there are a lot of human beings that are suffering which is unbelievable unfathomable 
to to try to even have an idea of that suffering because we had not suffered that way ourselves. And uh, this inexhaustible tenderness to all beings can really make a big difference that we can um, nurture, develop in ourselves. I want to finish with um, a meta practice before we do the four vows. May all beings experience peace. May all beings realize love in their hearts. May all beings have good shelter, water, warmth, and a space. May the four-legged in animal concentration camps experience healing. May the two-winged in cages experience freedom. May the ocean creatures are safe. And for the sake of all beings, may we all be realized. I love you. I give you heart, like in Spain. I give you kisses, like in Spain. I have a Spanish blood. I'm a passionate person. I love you. See you on Friday. This only is the prelude for Friday. Friday is a gift to you all.